All right. So hello and welcome to everyone to the Skill Builders Workshop on Researching Your Family Past. I'm Casey Long. I'm one of the librarians at Agnes Scott College. And co-presenting with me today is David Russell from DeKalb County Public Library. So hello. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is we're not going to be teaching you how to do genealogy, but we're really going to be focusing in on the sources that you have available both at Agnes Scott College and at the public library. So David's representing the public library here um, in Decatur, but what he has to say applies to pretty much every single public library across the United States. So he's going to give you some really good insights if you're in New Jersey. Um, or Philadelphia, you'll know what are some things that you could ask from your public library. So to get us started, I'm going to have him because he, public librarians, they know so much more about genealogy type research. People go to them all the time to get started with their questions. So he's much more of an expert than I am. And I'm going to go ahead and let him tell you about some of the types of things that people ask him. Thanks, y'all. Uh, my name's David. Like Casey said, and I've worked at DeKalb Library for about four years now. And the reference desk at Decatur gets a lot of genealogy questions. So I was just gonna briefly go over a story um, of one such question that I got. And um, it was actually almost a year ago today because uh, it was Halloween and we always dress up on Halloween. And my go-to costume for Halloween is uh, from A League of Their Own. The, the Women in Professional Baseball League movie with uh, some always Tom Hanks from League of Their Own. And this patron came up and he wanted to talk baseball and we talked baseball for a little bit. And he was actually originally from Rockford where the Rockford teachers were in the movie. And, but his relatives were in Atlanta before that. And he had heard a family story uh, about a great grandfather who went to high school in the Atlanta area and had hit a grand slam to win a high school baseball championship for his uh, high school baseball team. And he wanted to find out if that was true, but he didn't have much to go on. So we hit up Ancestry Library Edition with the name. And uh, from that, we got like a yearbook photo and we figured out where he went to high school. And then we went to a city directory to get like an address where he was. And then we went to the books on uh, like past Fulton County and we found a picture of the high school and when he went to school. And from that, we had enough to go on. So we started searching our like microfilm from way, way back in the 1800s. And we found a record actually in like an 1865 edition of the Atlanta Constitution that was a sports highlight and it was him his great grandfather mentioned hitting this grand slam to win. So he was just like overwhelmed with joy. He printed out like five copies. He was gonna frame it for like his brothers and sisters. And it was just like a really great reference interview and re great reference situation because we used four or five different sources just to get this one thing. So that's, that's what I love about working and doing genealogy at the library. That's awesome. That it just took this one small little interaction. He wasn't even thinking about finding this. And he spent how much time with you wandering around the library, checking into these sources? Yeah, it was like a couple hours by the time we put everything together. That's great. So that's the kind of thing that um, you should feel free to ask your public librarians. Um, you know, not everybody's as cheerful as David and I are, but most people are. So you should just always feel free to go ahead and ask. Um, but we know the reason you're here is you want to get into that ancestry.com. Um, so we do have the library edition and normally the library edition is only available um, on campus or at the library. And in fact, it's usually only available inside the library itself. But until December, it's available uh, through your public library and through Agnes Scott from home. So we're gonna start off by, I'm gonna share my screen again, and we're gonna go this time um, to the library homepage. And I'm just gonna tell you how to get there. I'm sure you guys all know how to get to our databases A to Z list, but um, there's two locations on our library website for it. First is databases A to Z over here on the top left. And if you're more used to searching with Discover, um, you'll find it right underneath the Discover search box. Um, there's databases A to Z. I'm just going to use this one at the top and click on it. And 
from here, since we know the name of the database we're searching for, all we have to do is follow the list of A databases. So I'm gonna click on A and scroll down until I find Ancestry um, Library Edition. All right, there we go. You can see it right here, Ancestry Library Edition. It says on campus only, but I'm pretty positive uh, during the regular school years that it's um, just available in the library. Um, so this is a great time for you to take advantage of this tool without having to come into our space. So we're gonna go ahead and click on this. And so it's opening up. If you haven't logged into our databases today, then it might ask you for your network ID and password. Um, so that screen looks exactly like it does when you're logging into Canvas or into your email. So you should be able to see that and just use that email username and password. And then you'll get to this page. So um, hopefully everybody who's following along has gotten there. And you can see that uh, it looks very much like the regular Ancestry.com website. It is a pared down version. You'll notice that you can't access your account here. So if you are somebody who has subscribed to Ancestry in the past and you've collected a lot of things, um, I don't believe you can save um, things from there. And for instance, my mother, David, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but um, I believe my mother, when she did her DNA thing, um, we haven't been able to use it for those reasons either. So, um, so you might actually have to subscribe for some of those more advanced features. Is that right, David? Yeah, that's right. They only let you do so much with the library edition and the rest, like a lot of like the family tree stuff and stuff like that, you can't really, you can't print it with the library edition. You need like the full, we want your money pay edition. But we're gonna show you that there is a ton of stuff that you can find in here. So before I click on begin searching, which is really just all you have to do to get started, I just want you to see down here that there's just um, the types of collections that they have. They have the census, they have vital records. So that's like your um, social security, death index, birth certificates, things like that. Um, military records, so draft notices, and immigration records. So there's, um, maybe you have something specific that you're looking into. Um, down here are some of the quick links to the types of things that people often are interested in looking at. I remember David said that they have city directories over at the public library. Um, not all the city directories that are out there will be here, but they have digitized a lot of city directories. So you'll probably still have to go to your public library, go through their microfilm or through their print collection to get to some of these things, but you might as well start here. And the one thing I wanted to tell you about census, um, you'll see that the census only goes, um, the most recent census records that they have is 1940. Does anybody know why that is? How many years um, do they hold the census before um, they release it? Just curious if anybody knew. Um, it's 72 years, and that's based off of the lifespan of a woman um, in the 1950s. So um, the idea is that we're trying to keep people's privacy. There's a lot of details in those census records, and we don't want people's privacy to be um, revealed. So my mother was born in 1944. So for the most part, in terms of census stuff, I'm not gonna find anything about her. So I'm gonna do our searching on my grandfather. And so I'm just going to go ahead and do a demo search for you guys and click on begin searching. And you'll see that it has a really great form um, with lots of options for how you can start searching for the people you're interested in. Now, I have a vague idea how old my grandfather was, but um, I don't know exactly his birth year. So I'm just going to start with his name, Alphonse. And then his last name is Voke. Um, and uh, he lived in Monroe County, Illinois. So there's other variations of the names that I could do. That's not actually the um, city that he was living in, but I've had it the most success under Monroe County. So since I've played with this several times, I'm getting a feel for what are the cities and locations and counties that are working for me. But you'll see in a minute that they leave a lot of leeway to help you um, discover things that might not be the way you wrote it into your search. So let's go ahead and run this search. And we'll see the types of records that come up. And we're just gonna do a very basic demonstration just to show you how easy this is to use and the types of things you might be able to discover about your family and some potential pitfalls that you might run into. So the first thing is, is that um, we see a list of results over here. 
Um, and over here, you can see what I was talking about with the broader and narrower. So they're doing a very broad search for Alphonse. They're doing a semi-broad search for Vogue. And they're doing a broad search for Monroe, Illinois. What it means when they're doing this broad is that it's looking for other variations, but I can control that if I want. So if I'm not getting very satisfactory records over here, I can change up my search. And I can also drill down to the types of information that I want. But I'm gonna start by looking through these records. And the first thing I can tell you is that this is not my grandfather. This one right here, not only is the name spelled wrong, um, and it, it, this is actually one of the towns he did live in. So it would be kind of confusing but this is not him. I know because 1889 um, was not a time period that he was born. Um, he's actually this one down here, um, 1908, and he died in 1982. So I can see some details that I recognize here. Um, also, if I mouse over this one, the census records, um, I also see other things that are very uh, helpful in terms of determining whether this is my grandfather. So the thing for me is that I do know I have a great uncle named Ray, and I have a great uncle named Erm uh, and Tony. So I can see that Uncle Erm and Uncle Tony and Uncle Ray are all here, so this must be my family record. Believe it or not, you may have never met somebody by the last name Volk, but Volk is like the name Smith in Germany. So it's a very common name, and within this small town, there are so many people named Volk. So believe it or not, there's going to be more Lewises, there's going to be more Raymonds, um, and they're all kind of around the same age too. Kind of like, I guess, uh, yeah, Jessica or Rebecca or something like that, those kind of names that we hear today. All right, so um, you can see that that was really easy for me to identify uh, a record. And I wanted to show you um, also some of the other items that are here. So you can see here that um, it identifies where he is buried and um, uh, some details about who his spouse and children are. Um, so I could click on this and get more details. Um, I also love this. This is something I came across. It's his draft card from 19... The 19, um, I don't know exactly when this one was, but you can see that um, this is his draft card. So this is either his handwriting, I believe it might be my grandmother's, just because this part down here looks like her handwriting. Um, I feel like she might have done most of it. Um, but anyway, what I love on here is that you can see who he was married to at the time or um, somebody who knows him and what their relationship is. So that helps you figure out who might have been somebody that was related to your, the person that you care about. And this is the part that I thought was really cool was it had his employer name. So when I was doing my research, I was able to look this up and you might think that this was a bit of nepotism, but our family has nothing to do with this L.A. boat. He just worked for another guy named Boat. Um, and I was able to use that information to learn more about that family and think about the relationship between that family and my own family uh, because they are from a very small town. Um, he worked as a meat cutter at IGA grocery store uh, and it was the Boat IGA. So um, I was able to learn from about these people that that started off as a um, bakery by a woman, which was really cool. And then from there, um, it became a grocery store. And she had several sons, um, and they took over the, the business afterwards. But this is her husband's name. Even He was the employer, even though she was the one that ran the business. So that's a cool little factoid that you, I was able to learn from that record. Um, this gave me a nugget to start searching. Um, and so, so far, you can see that we've been able to find census records from 1920s, 1930s on my grandfather. Um, and the one that I wanted to point out that I like the most is this 1910. So if I click on this, you'll see the full record of some of the things you can find in here. And um, so I can see that my grandfather, my great grandfather's name was Louis B. Boat. Uh, great grandmother's name was Anna Boat. I knew some of these details, but not really about Louis. I can see uh, the ages. So how old was he in 1910? Uh, he was just one and the ages of the other people. And this one here is interesting because I, I didn't remember a Paul Voke at all. Um, and these two individuals here, they're much older. So I'm trying to understand more about these folks. You can actually click on the image here. And this is one of the best features about Ancestry is that it has these features of um, these digitized records. For things like the digitized records from the 1940s, 
um, you can't get that from the census. Um, this is kind of a proprietary thing from the ancestry, um, but they went through this work. And so you have to use ancestry to get to this beautiful looking document here. And you can see that it's highlighting my family right here. And if I look deeply at this one, um, you can see who, what the relationship is. So um, remember, I was curious who this Paul Vogt was, and it shows that it's um, the nephew of Louis Vogt. So this would have been um, my grandfather's cousin um, who lived with him temporarily. And then this is the father of the head of the household and the mother of the head of the household. So now I know Gerhard Vogt and Teresa Vogt were my um, great, great grandparents. And here you can see the wife. Um, so they list the relationships. And the other thing that's neat in here is if we go further in, you can see the other aspects that you can learn. You can learn how long somebody was married, um, the children's ages, the birthplaces, where the, and for each individual, uh, this is very useful. I just happened to have a record where um, my grandfather's parents were living with him, but you can see that for my grandmother, um, my great grandmother, uh, Anna, that both of her father and her mother were both born in Illinois. So I know they didn't immigrate um, within her generation, uh, the generation before her, but my grandpa, great grandfather, his parents did. So both of them came from Germany. And so that's some of the details you can get there. You can also get their occupation, that they were a farmer, um, what languages they speak. So it looks like Gerhard and uh, um, Teresa still predominantly spoke German. Um, and then some other things are looking at the industry. Let's see if I can go over a little bit further. I know that they also have um, school number of years in school and stuff like that as well. So there's just a lot of um, can read and write and whether they own property. So you can barely see it on my screen. Um, trying to get this whole thing to go over and whether they own property and if they had a mortgage. So this is a lot of great information that you can gather just on a few people. And so hopefully you can see some of the details that you might be able to see on your um, own searches. So that's just me going back one generation past my mother. Um, and I'm gonna go back to the main screen. Um, and that's pretty much for me in terms of ancestry, um, what I know about it. Um, I haven't had as much success with some of the other records, but I do know that David has. So I'm gonna let David take over and tell you about some of the other really cool things that you might be able to find in here. So he's gonna request okay. my screen, approval to take over my screen and here he goes. All right, so I am gonna do a search um, that I just actually did for the first time yesterday for um, a 93rd birthday party for uh, my girlfriend's grandmother. And we thought it would be fun while we were all on her very first Zoom call to uh, do an ancestry search and see what came up. So uh, we found some fun stuff that, um, some fun other details that weren't on Casey's. So I'm just gonna, uh, kind of search her name and I can show you some other things that you might be able to find on Ancestry. She's from Madison, Wisconsin, right outside of it. So if you just search that, you don't have to worry about the birth year. Um, they have school yearbooks um, like this one and then you can view the school yearbook. and then zoom in to your specific relative. And once you do that, uh, like her name was Wilma Eichster and there she is. There nice. we go, second, second row. It gives you like her sorority and then you can search by that. Um, it gives you her classmates and her major in college. This is a University of Wisconsin-Madison 1950 yearbook. So she got to see her college yearbook photo that she hadn't seen probably since she took it 70 years before. So that was kind of a kind of a cool thing. And then we found uh, again with the city directories, I can show you what that looks like. And then from there you can you can find her and then you can see you know, where they lived at that time, which is kind of a cool 
cool feature. Can you, you can see if they moved and then you can go back to do an address search to see what the house may have looked like, what it looks like now and that sort of thing. So city directories are definitely, uh, definitely a fun, fun thing to check out. And then after that, let's see, there she is. There's also, more school yearbooks of her sorority. So she got to reminisce about some of her sorority sisters and she was telling stories about some of the shenanigans they got in in the 50s, which is nothing like today. And then um, another cool document we got to see was uh, the census, like Casey showed you. And what was cool about that for her is it showed the farm that they ran and just you know who owned the the land and it was just it was just fascinating like where the farm was and the county and where everyone was born it was just a really really fascinating fascinating search and you can see here her mom and dad their birthplace was switzerland and you can see that right there on the record so you know that's that's them and she was 11 in 1940 um so she was talking about life on the farm and having to get up at 4 a.m. every day from the age of five until she left for college. So that was kind of a blast from the past. And then you can kind of go through all categories. And one of the things they did, we, we went to was uh, immigration. And we could find where, when they came over in the actual passenger list that corresponded to them coming over. So they got to view the actual passenger list that they were on when they, uh, when they immigrated. So that was another, another fun feature that's available uh, to you. I love and, that it has the occupations there too, traveler, salesman, minister. Yeah, exactly. So there's so much there. It's just like amazing that, the the thing I love about Ancestry too, though, is like how clear these documents are. You know, you'd think with wear and tear it wouldn't be so easy, but these documents are like crystal clear, where you can actually you can actually see, you know, when they came over, and you can actually read the information. It's it's really really fascinating. So that was, uh, yeah, that was really fascinating, and then. Uh, yeah, and then we did record location Europe, North America, and we just kind of played around with it. But in addition to what Casey said, there's just so much, you know, so much out there on Ancestry. And you really, your best bet is just to kind of play around and, and see what you find. And it, they make it super easy to print and save everything uh, in terms of photos and downloading photos. And you can always use like an image capture as well if you wanted to download information without saving it directly to your hard drive. So that's kind of uh, what we found on Ancestry. It's just depending on you know whether they were in the military or not, you might get a little more. But it was it's a really fascinating search tool. So we have about four or five minutes left. Um, David, do you want to tell us? Uh, do you want me to stop sharing my screen and have you pull up your um, your slides so that you can tell them a little bit about what's over at the public library and also what they might actually be able to find at public libraries that are in other locations around the country? Yeah, sure. Awesome. And like I said before, we'll stay a little bit later if you guys have questions. So the first thing I wanted to point out is this is the decablibrary.org website, which is where, where I work. This is our website. And we just did like a redesign to make things easier to find. So uh, right, right on the page, we're here to help you. So this is how you can find out about paying your fines, printing from home, uh, finding books to read. We're doing a new reader's advisory service, picking up holds, and get a library card. So even virtually, you can get a library card online, and you can request books. You can use all of our databases. And we won't even be having to verify addresses until 2021. So. As long as you have a DeKalb County address, get on it, get a library card, get your access to Ancestry and everything else we have. So just, this is an easy form, just fill it out 
and within five minutes you can use Galileo and the rest of our databases if you need them. So that's the first thing I wanted to highlight and then I kind of wanted to go through and uh, show you some other resources at the uh, DeKalb libraries in the genealogy area. So we have microfilm. Uh, we have New York Times on microfilm from 1851 up until present day. A lot of their stuff, we also have online access to the New York Times every day with a library card. So uh, your library card gets you that as well. Uh, the Atlanta Journal and the Atlanta Constitution, they were separate papers before they came together. Uh, the Atlanta Journal we have from 1883 and the Constitution from 1868. So you can use those resources. People use those all the time to try and find mostly death notices um, that aren't online. Um, a lot of other genealogy type information. People use microfilm and our four microfilm stations quite often. So those are three of the many, many uh, newspapers that we have on microfilm, but those are the ones I kind of wanted to highlight. Uh, we have reference books. Uh, a lot of, you know, Fulton County back then is a really great resource for pictures that you might, or yesterday's Atlanta, just really good resources for pictures and uh, information and history on what was maybe on your property before your house or what your old high school looked like. And some of them are family histories, which will take families back generations and generations. And others are land records that will go back hundreds of years all in one book. And those are in our reference collection that you can uh, check out in terms of sitting at the library, making photocopies. And if you're interested in anything in the book right now, when the library is not open, you can just email us and we can research it and scan it for you. Uh, journals, we have several journals like the Georgia Genealogical Quarterly, um, just journals that go through the history of Georgia and also tips on specifically searching for genealogy materials in Georgia and where you can go and what you can do. Those are also available in reference to take a look at. City directories, we do have the physical copies of the Atlanta City Directory from 1928 to 1960. So if those aren't online or if the online copy is a little fuzzy and you want to just come and see where your relatives were in the city in print, you know, you're more than welcome to once the library opens again. Uh, these get a lot of use, actually. A lot of um, a lot of people that are in, um, like, they're good for legal resources, even. People, like, taking over a property and they want to see what was on that property before. They'll just take all the city directories out and go through them. Um, they, they do get a lot of use, and as you can see, they're well-loved. But they definitely are a good resource uh, to check out. And they are online as well through that uh, database, and we also have them on microfilm. There's a LibGuide on our website too. Um, if you just search genealogy into um, decablibrary.org, this is gonna come up. It gives you Ancestry Library Edition, Heritage Quest, and the Obituaries and Death Notices database, which uh, a lot of that is also integrated into Ancestry. And then catalog links for different books in our catalog that will help you get started with genealogy in terms of researching your family history for the first time, or a little more in depth. Um, Heritage Quest, is if you see the if you look at the bottom of Heritage Quest online, it says powered by Ancestry. So this is like the ProQuest version of Ancestry. And the one advantage to that prior to COVID is this is the one you could get from home without having to be in the library or using a library card. So you could get this from home. It it does base it is basically a stripped down version of uh, Ancestry with the same city directory, census maps. Um, it does have digitized books, um, but I haven't really had much luck searching anything that would actually come up in the digitized books. But basically, the only, this is basically a free version of Ancestry Library Edition, which is why it's, it's available, but they're, they're very similar. Um, Ancestry just does a little bit more. All right, and that's, uh, that's basically our, uh, our other library resources. And our uh, Ask a Librarian feature is up and running too. So if you have any specific questions to the library, just uh, shoot us an email and we will definitely help you out. And I wanted to emphasize again to everyone that um, people always meet a librarian. They're like, oh my God, you're so amazing. And I, uh, how did you get to be so nice? Almost 
all librarians are this nice and this helpful. So, and all of them have these tools where you can ask questions. So ask questions and they will help you with it. Um, and if they don't help you, just ask again and you'll get somebody mm -hmm. else. So um, I know we're, we're over time, but I wanted to show you guys just a couple more things available at Agnes Scott. It's really not gonna take long. Um, we actually have a very robust historical newspaper collection. Um, and I already showed you how to go through our databases A to Z list. All these can be found through the databases A to Z list. So I'm just gonna give you a quick run through of um, what are some of the sources. So here, if we go, um, if we wanna access our newspaper databases, then um, you can see that we have 45 databases that are found for newspapers. So I had narrowed it down to just newspapers and it's just showing the first few, but 45 publications, that's pretty amazing. So um, let's take a look at what a few of those are. This is a list of just the ones that are city papers. So if you recognize a city where you have had family members, look at those dates. They go back to the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, and so you might be able to find something about your family members within this. And the ones that are highlighted in pink and purple, those are historically African American newspapers. So um, not only do you get uh, what's happening in the community at large, um, you can look specifically what were things that people um, who are African American cared about at that particular time and how did they reflect uh, information in their community. Here's some more that we have. Again, um, there's a, several historical U.S. newspaper collections, so chronicling the, Amer the America. That's actually a free one from the Library of Congress, but we have it in our list anyway. But if you are researching the Civil War, whether it be looking at it from the perspective of people who weren't living in the South to people who were living in the South, then you'll be able to see Civil War era historical newspapers. It's just a collection of those. And then there is this Independent Voices. This is more of a contemporary collection of um, resources that are alternative presses. So that might be worthwhile. If you're studying Jewish history, so if you have family members who are Jewish, then you might find these newspapers down here helpful. Um, because uh, especially the Southern Isra Israelite historical newspaper, that's an Atlanta newspaper. And then finally, um, once you start discovering whether you have family members in other countries, then you can use some of these over here. We have Chinese historical newspapers, uh, several UK newspapers, um, the Jerusalem Post, uh, China Morning Post, Indian Times of India. And then for me, Toronto Star, my family, one of my family lines is from Canada and I was actually able to find information about some family members there. And if you, most of these only go up to 1990 if you're lucky, um, the dates might be earlier, but we have two newspaper collections, news and newspapers and newspaper source that are more contemporary newspaper collections. So many of the news and newspaper sources go back to the 1980s um, or the 1990s. So you get a really good full range. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out is that we have some primary source collections. And again, if you use the databases A to Z list and you narrow it down by subject to primary sources, you'll see that in terms of primary sources, which are archival historical documents, we have 124 uh, databases that predominantly just have historical records in them. Um, so you can narrow it down to that and then kind of browse through. But a few of my favorites of that 124, my favorite is African American communities. This is five communities throughout the United States where they pull historical documents, um, scrapbooks, pamphlets, newspapers, periodicals, correspondence, all sorts of things like that, that um, are about the African American communities in those um, five cities, um, or four cities, is it Atlanta, Chicago, St. Louis, and Brooklyn are the cities that they focus in on, and then they have a collection of cities in North Carolina. There's also, if you know that you have family members who are involved in the civil rights movement, then this collection down here might be helpful, Civil Rights and the Black Freedom Struggle. If you um, have family members that are American Indian, um, then you might find some documentation about tribes um, in this database. Again, if there's uh, immigration records that you're looking for, this immigration records of the INS might be helpful. And finally, again, from the American Civil War, um, letters and diaries, there's several things from that time period as well. That's just a handful of things that we have. So I just wanted to make sure that you all know about those collections. And I'm going to um, 
just stop our recording in just a minute. Just want to say thank you to the viewers for uh, watching. And um, we hope that if you have any questions, you'll contact us through the way that David mentioned or the library at Agnes Scott at library at agnescott.edu. And uh, we are definitely here to help you as we indicated before. So. Um,